Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Fortress of Comic News, episode 263. I am one of your hosts, Chris, alongside my magnificent co-host, Mike. What's up, Mike? Hey, what is up? Uh, Chris is not feeling well, but he's here to podcast for all of us lovely people. So let's thank him for that. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's a good old day. Keep to- working through the sickness. Decided to come and see if you were ready to record because I was watching the Red Sox lose nine to one. I'm like, well, fuck this shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, dude, it's been it's a rough it's a rough year for Red Sox fan. We won't go too much into it, but uh, I will um, I will say I you know the the big thing is always like it's it's preseason, but the season started so late that we're I I don't think we can use that excuse anymore. They just suck right now and they need to fix something it was a very successful sports weekend for me yeah um sixers moved on uh Mm. eagles got aj brown one of the best wide receivers in the league right now yep nfl Uh, draft that was the thing Mm -hmm. um yeah and some good draft picks so i'm i'm pretty stoked on sports i'm pretty stoked about the interview today because um if anyone has ever listened to this podcast for at least a split second uh, you would know that we talk about a specific Doom Patrol issue. Uh, this Doom Patrol issue, I believe it's issue 70. It doesn't take place directly after Graham Morrison. I think it's a few issues in. But um, the very talented and and uh, godly Rachel Pollock is on the show today, who created the greatest Odyssey. super villain of all time. I won't say greatest because he did he did feature on our show back in the day as a shitty villain, but maybe greatest shittiest villain of all time, Codpiece. I said what I said, Mike. Yeah, I know you feel very strongly about that. <laughs> so this yeah, we're, a lot. Yeah, I'm putting him above the spot. All yeah, right? that's pretty. That's crazy. <laughs> that's not like you. Um, yeah. So Rachel's on the show today. Uh, we'll talk with her. She doesn't do comics anymore. She does novels, but we are gonna break down cod piece and then put them all back together kind of like he assembles his giant cod piece um so i'm excited for that it's uh it's it's been a long time coming you know it's been over 200 episodes this is bound to happen eventually so pretty sure we're just gonna retire after this we're done right like this is it Mm -hmm. this is it we peaked there's no there's no going back (laughs) um and that's that's pretty much it. I got my Doctor Strange tickets uh, for next week. Going to go see it next Friday. Pretty pumped for that. Uh, Taking my old man, who's a Doctor Strange fan. Oh, all right. Yeah. That's interesting. Because he's not a big he, comic so he, fan, but he, he likes him. He likes... So when he was younger, he read comics. Actually, we've gone through the list of like... <laughs> big comics from when he was younger and mm-hmm. if he kept them all we'd be very very rich people um <laughs> but dr strange was one they always connected to he always liked uh fantasy and magic and that kind of stuff mm-hmm. so that mm-hmm. character always connected so we went and saw the first one together so gonna take him to see the second one and he watches all the marvel movies like he's you know yeah it's not like he doesn't watch them so uh Little little fun fact. I don't know if you know Neil Gaiman is on tour. He just does like evenings with Neil Gaiman where he sits and talks with people. And uh, I had to go out to dinner for work last week. And it was like I, I picked uh, like so Proctor's Theater is pretty packed during the summertime. And that's where he was speaking. And I was like, you know, taking these customers out. And I'm like, why the hell is it so busy tonight? And then I, I checked and I'm like, shit, Neil Gaiman is speaking tonight. Why didn't I get tickets? <laughs> and I had thought about, like, for a split second, ditching them to go. <laughs> uh, Sorry, uh, folks, up. our business meeting is concluded. Uh, yeah. Neil I fucking Gaiman's go. here. <laughs> and, like, I want to ask him questions, like, who would win in a fight, like, Batman or Swamp Thing? <laughs> 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 what do you think? Who do you think could beat Sandman in a fight? Yeah. So, how many times have you watched The Batman this past week? I haven't, dude. I haven't had three hours to sit down. <laughs> I started it. I started it. I got to the first ten minutes, and then I had to get up and do something. <laughs> uh, 
I am planning on rewatching it. I just honestly have had not had the time. Uh, I will. I, I'm going to rewatch it soon. Maybe even like this week. I'm hoping. So uh, you... same here. I worked like a 60 hour week this week. So okay. no time for anything other than Moon Knight because I have priorities. Oh, there um, you go. <laughs> but I did get the uh, the call from my father. Mm-hmm. Um, and the review was that thumb drive joke was kind of fucked up. And I said, yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, it was the funniest thing I've seen in a long time. Um, yeah, so that was some pretty good news this week we'll talk about with Batman. But, uh, I, you know, everybody that's watched it has told me they really liked it because, you know, a lot more people have watched it now because, um, surprisingly, people don't have four hours to spend in a movie theater <laughs> uh, most days. So, yeah, I think it was well received by everybody that's watched it. Um and and I think uh, I mean we'll talk about the news in a little bit. So we do have some TV news. Um, I don't see it on here, but uh, WB after this whole new CEO came in, they started axing some uh, some CW shows for good. Uh, I don't know. Legends of Tomorrow finally got canceled after season seven. Uh, they're talking about bringing. Uh, one of the shows, I think Lois and uh, are the adventures of, I don't know, Superman and Lois. I think that's coming to HBO. They're either like canceling stuff and moving stuff um, to HBO. And I think Grant Gustin is on for one more season. At least. That's yeah, I heard they were going to make like a half season to kind of conclude that as well. Yeah. Uh, with that, I do have some flashbacks from Pat, everybody. So I know you've been, uh, You've all been such good people this week, so let me let me bless you with that really quick. Um, <laughs> it's funny because even he stops paying attention to the episode, and then something happens where he like looked up and was like, "What the fuck's going on?" <laughs> uh, this is season eight, episode twelve. Uh, so the, if everybody remembers, the cool thing that happened last time was like Deathstorm showed up, so they're trying to figure out how to stop him. He's on a killing spree. Iris is sick with time. Uh, still getting worse. Deathstorm keeps trying to kidnap Caitlyn, turn her into a female Deathstorm because he's lonely. Uh, so the best part of the episode, Barry's chasing Deathstorm and starts throwing lightning and running on it. Which, like, this is a cool part. Like, he actually got excited for this. And that sounds pretty cool. Like, throwing lightning bolts and, like, running on top of the lightning bolts. And then Ride the Lightning by Metallica started playing. <laughs> which... That okay, that was pretty cool. Is it worth like however many episodes we are to season eight? No, <laughs> no, not at all. But I mean, it's a cool scene. Uh, I didn't need to, I don't need any more scenes. Thanks, Pat, for the flashbacks. But also, uh, yeah, this uh, this show needs to die, it needs to. Well, did you see? I didn't put it in the comic news either, but did you see that all these shows are gonna live on as comics now, too, for the five oh, people still watching? Great. And I think honestly, maybe two of them read comics. <laughs> honestly, like if you look at the flash numbers, like we were talking about how they dwindled from like five million viewers to one million viewers, and that's low for a TV show. That's like the best numbers you'll see for a comic book. <laughs> so if you even get half of those people, like you won't. You'll get maybe twenty percent, which is still what two hundred thousand issues. That's I'd be shocked to get twenty percent. No, you won't. You probably get five <laughs> percent. Let's be. Honest. I mean, Smallville went on as a comic afterwards. I think it lasted one season, maybe two. Yeah, because they did it in seasons still. Um, yeah, <laughs> and that's hard too. Smallville didn't have any. You didn't have any costumes in Smallville, so it was like, let's take this teen drama and move it to comic books, and still not give anybody like, you know, costumes like normal comic books. I think they made him Superman after that. I just remember Smallville oh, okay. being like the biggest cock tease in the planet. Yep. Like just almost there. Just yeah. getting me to the edge and then just not giving me what I want. Yep. Yeah. Mm. They, what, how did, I, yeah, we don't even talk about that. That show was, uh, I could, Lex Luthor was what made me upset about that show. I thought that guy was very annoying to watch. Um, okay. We do have some TV news. The Walking Dead spinoff featuring Daryl and Carol. Daryl Carroll has hit a snag. Um, to be specific, Carroll has left the series permanently. 
Little is known to why, but AMC is now shifting, making the series a Daryl centric series in her absence. <laughs> Probably because Daryl was getting paid triple what Carol was getting paid because most people had to see Daryl. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, yeah. Who knows? But this is another show that just stop, guys. What are you I, doing? E- yeah. E- like, even I haven't watched the last season and a half. What's going on? Like, you lost me, then. I will uh, say. I keep saying I'll go back and check it out, but I'm like, I don't, yeah. A lot of fans like the. Yeah, watch Moon Knight. <laughs> a lot of the fans like the Daryl Carroll romance. Like, they're into that shit, so. They might even lose a lot of fans if Carol's not there. Yeah, I never got that romance either. It's weird. It's weird. I thought it would be hilarious if they just wanted to piss everybody off and make Daryl gay. I thought that would have been the the move. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That would have been phenomenal. Just the tier A trolling. (laughs) Um, Other than that, Daryl's just Daryl. Walking Dead in shambles. Nothing's new. Yeah. Um, this still won't. I mean, this won't affect the other two or three spinoffs they've been working on. I guess they still got a Negan spinoff coming. So, uh, boy, uh, the Harley Quinn animated series getting spinoff series for HBO Max. The spinoff will focus around Kite Man as he teams up with Golden Glider. Now, this is good news. Uh, I and I saw this earlier in the week, and I was like, "Damn, that reminds me, I got to keep watching Harley Quinn because I'm on season two. That show is hilarious." Uh, and this is going to be even better because Kite Man is like a really good part of the show. Yeah, this might get me to check out Harley Quinn. Just knowing that it's a prequel to the better series, Kite Man is amazing. You haven't Kyle. watched it? I have not watched a single frame of it. There is uh this old Jewish man that lives with her as like a roommate. I don't know if it's her or like her landlord. I don't even think he's a villain in comics, but it's voiced by Jason Alexander from Seinfeld. And it's probably one of the fucking funniest characters. There's so many great people voicing, uh, like one of the guys from Kerber Enthusiasm just voices a talking piranha plant. That's like one of Ivy's plants. So like in the show, Ivy starts dating, Poison Ivy starts dating Kite Man. And Kite Man's like a, like, (laughs) like a really, like Ivy's like, you know, the badass bad girl and like Kite Man's like the, the like goody goody person and it's so funny that they're dating it's that's part of season two and it's fucking great it's hilarious it's it's really good stuff yeah like, the cast is good it's just like it's what we always talk about like i have a hard time getting past the harley quinn of it all yeah me too um but it's 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 making so many jokes about the dc universe there's so many characters in every episode that you you like you know, I, especially in season two, Harley has like a like a crew around her that and like King Shark is one of them. King Shark is hilarious. Um, Clayface. Clayface really stays with the whole like struggling actor vibe. And that's really funny. Who's Lake Bell? Lake Bell? Apparently that's who voices Poison Ivy. I don't know. Um, no Ron Funtress is in this show as King Shark. I'm watching it tonight. Yeah, dude, King Shark is hilarious. King Shark is one of the best parts of the show. It's funny because like you don't even like. And Diedrich Kaylee Bader Kiyoko, plays Batman. Yes. Yep. <sighs> and apparently, so like another thing about this show, one of the best episodes is coming up in season two, and I haven't gotten to it yet, and. It's known as like one of the best show, one of the best episodes in like animated DC stuff, and it focuses on Bruce Wayne. <laughs> so I can't wait to get to that episode. Diedrich Bader, Batman Braving the Bold, or no, was that him mm-hmm. Braving the Bold? Pretty sure, yeah. The guy yeah. from uh, the guy from the Drew Carey show. Yeah, two tricks at yeah. one time, dude. Yes. Um, that's what he'll be known for forever, everybody. So mm-hmm. don't make fun of me. <laughs> Yeah, I fucking love that show. When you say the dude from Kirby Enthusiasm, I want you to put some respect on that. We're talking about oh. J.P. Smooth. Sorry, J.P. Smooth. Yeah, I couldn't think of his name. J.P. Smooth is hilarious. I will be watching the show tonight. Yeah, see, Chris, you've been welcome. You've been christened. Uh, get it, Chris. And oh, man, I'm sorry. Chris has that, risen. 
Yep. Uh, but yeah, check it out. It is funny. If you have HBO, it's it's really good shit. Um, okay, you watch Moon, Up, Moon Knight Episode 5. I'm behind. I'm going to catch up at some point. I'm also behind a better call, so I'm just behind on my shows. So you can uh, catch me up here. What what has happened? I fucking love this episode. Wow. Okay. This episode is strictly um, Oscar Isaac acting his balls off. Um, okay. It's a very Stephen slash Mark centric episode. Um, I believe at one point we get a hint of Jake but they don't really say it's Jake. Um, but Oscar is such a good actor that just his facial expression. I was like, that's a different guy. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, um, yeah. it's a lot of, so this episode is basically the backstory of Mark and how he creates Steven. Okay. And why he creates, St- creates Steven. Um, I want to, uh, congratulate Tom Payer on his performance as, uh, Mark Spector's father. Um, <laughs> everybody who saw this episode now. understands that joke. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it basically, they have to balance the scales so that they can ascend to the next plane, um, and not be stuck in purgatory. By the way, I was correct. They're in purgatory. Um, makes sense. It's just Egyptian purgatory. And so they have to go back in their past and figure things out. And that's when Mark kind of reveals to Steven that you were created to heal, to prevent me from feeling the trauma of what happened in my life. And it's mm. zero moon night, like almost no action, but just a phenomenal episode. Um, this kind of rocket that if, as long as they stick the landing, this might become like my second favorite show, just based on this episode. Wow! All right, MCU show, I should say. Okay, awesome. Fucking awesome. Does he wear the Does he wear the suit at all? There is zero Moon Knight in this episode. You know, I should have known. You're talking to me about facial expressions and alter egos. I'm like, I didn't hear him mention at all. No capes. No, no capes. Fighty. No capes. Amazing Just... episode. Okay. Okay. I'll take your word for it, everybody. I'm glad you're all liking Moon Knight. I'm happy for you all. Um, yeah, so this week uh, was the DC Films Rat CinemaCon in Atlanta, which I don't know if CinemaCon is an open thing for civilians that aren't in the cinema industry, but I would love to go sometime. I think it was um, in Vegas this year, though. Oh, was it? Okay. I believe so. Uh, they showed off a bunch of new behind-the-scenes footage, some trailers. Uh, I did read some... I read some spoilers uh, for the trailers and the, the footage. Um, one big piece of news is that WB is officially announced they've greenlit the Batman 2, Matt Reeves, Robert Pattinson, Zoe Kravitz returning. So awesome. That's what you want to see. Yeah. Is anyone surprised by that? <laughs> no. <laughs> they made a bunch of money. Uh I will say the stuff that I read about um everything sounded cool, like the, the, the trailers and stuff, the um the whole flash sequence they showed sounded pretty cool when I read about it. Um obviously dealing with like Flashpoint. Uh, they talked about, they showed some scenes from Aquaman, no surprise there, um, some footage, and then they talked, like, the Black Adam description was just, like, Adam Smasher, Dr. Fate, Hawkman, it was just, like, showing characters, and I'm like, that, that's still kind of concerning, because that just means they don't have a plot, (laughs) they're just like, we brought in all these cool characters, look at them, uh, so I guess I guess we'll see. I think oh the Shazam Shazam trailer dropped. It sounded pretty dope. Um, like you know Shazam versus Heather Mir or uh, Helen Mirren. So that's gonna be friggin' dope. My uh, favorite part of that was all I read about that trailer was they made a Fast and the Furious joke. Everybody and I'm just sitting they, there going, why do I care? <laughs> yeah, right. What? <laughs> cool. Um, they made a joke about another franchise. Yeah. 
Then this one's actually about superheroes. Um, all in all, let's see. Let's see. Put your money where your mouth is, DC. Because I've, I've seen some really cool trailers from you guys before. Looking at you, Batman versus Superman. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, yeah. One of the best. I think that, like, for one of the best trailers I've ever seen, man, what a letdown. Uh, honestly, though, Man of Steel trailer was pretty fucking dope. If you guys remember the first little intro to Hans Zimmer's music, too, like, and the voiceover of, uh, um, I want to say Kurt Russell. Is it Kurt Russell? I'll say I still think Man of Steel got too harsh of criticism. Yeah. Um, I wish he didn't kill Zod at the end because that's not very Superman like. But other than that, like, I thought that movie was pretty good, actually. Yeah. Oh, that's a thing. Fucking Michael Shannon's back as Zod in the Flash movie. Yeah. Hell yeah. Like, dude, I things about Man of Steel, Michael Shannon stole the show. Like, man. <sighs> what do you think are the chances? Because I was having this conversation. Um, what do you think the chances are that at the end of Flashpoint, they come back to current time and like, Ezra Miller isn't Flash anymore, and it's like somebody else. Like Dude, let's say Grant Gustin. That'd be great. I oh my god, his contract's finishing up. Like get him, get him in the movie. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just feel like this. Uh, they they're, they're, they're going to change too much of a train wreck. Like you need to get rid of him. Yeah. Um, and for the leaks that I'm seeing about like the screenings. That um, I don't know. You know, I'm reading. I'm reading stuff all over the internet. Don't know if it's true. That's why I'm not going to talk about a lot of it. People are saying that like maybe the last ten to fifteen minutes they could really adjust to get rid of Ezra Miller as as like they're changing things in the end of the Flash movie, like and it's becoming concrete in that last ten to fifteen minutes. So like they it it could just be a couple scenes where they're like, bam, you know, Ezra's gone. Uh. Mara's gone. <laughs> All these people. I don't know. Like DC's probably waiting to see who else fucks up before they release the movie. But like, <laughs> um, yeah, it seems like Mara needs to go too. Which is, infor- I mean, hopefully they can just recast her because that's a great character. And what I if, just think what Ezra if, obviously yeah. needs help yeah, in some way, right. and he needs mm-hmm. to get away from all this crap. And you as a as a movie maker and as a uh, production house need to get away from that fucking train wreck. And I will say this. I did read something about uh, test screenings or script for Aquaman and Mara. I don't know. Take this with a grain of salt, everybody, but she's maybe not even in the movie for more than 10 to 15 minutes to begin with. So that would make a lot of sense for why DC kind of just said, listen, she's only in the movie for 10 minutes. Let's just get this done. Get it out of the way. And then she's out of our lives. <laughs> so Listen, I guess we'll see. DC, I'm telling you, everybody, everybody is recastable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So just look at, she's only just look in for at, 10 minutes. Yeah. Do what right. Snyder did and fucking find somebody and green screen them in. <laughs> yeah. Ex- yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dude, I saw deep fakes online of like, there was a, there was like a YouTube video of like seven different deep fakes of, actors faces over Mara's and like I think one ended up being like Danny DeVito at the end and even that looked fine (laughs) fantastic well you saw Army of the Dead right no I have not I didn't watch it so I'm not gonna remember the woman's name but one of the actresses in there was she was never on set Mm -hmm. and she's the best part of the movie really because yeah the actor who played the other role had I don't know did something fucked up in some way Okay. So they had to get rid of them. And so they brought in this other actress and it just put her in front of a green screen, had her read all the lines, and then digitally edit her in. And it's so phenomenal. It, you wouldn't That's even so know crazy. if I didn't tell you. Yeah. Um, okay, so from CinemaCon, we got some Sony news. Uh, another Spider-Man villain movie. This one's all about El Muerto to star Benito Antonio Martinez Ocasio, a.k.a. Bad Bunny. Who's uh who's Bad Bunny? Is that like a rapper name or something? Okay, I don't feel as old now. First of all, okay. uh, was it El Morto? Yeah, El Morto. 
Nobody knows who this character is. Al um, Morso, yeah. Nobody no. knows. Even I the will... most diehard Spider-Man fans in the world would have to be like, uh, oh yeah, he showed up in the... Uh, I friendly. will say, I have a Hispanic comic book friend that is excited for this. I'm gonna just going to say it. He knows that who side of it, is. Yeah. That side of it I get. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Good on you. I, had no, I have no idea who it is. From a publicity standpoint, <laughs> nobody knows who this fucking character is. I literally asked Spider-Man friends of mine, and it took them a while to be like, oh, yeah, he showed up in, like, the amazing or friendly Spider-Man something something. I'm like, wow, deep cuts. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I was going to put a joke in here saying that nobody knows who the character or the person is, but then I'm like, I'm an old man. And maybe yeah. Bad Bunny is still relevant, and Mike knows who it is because he's still like his hip with the kids. Um, <laughs> no way, dude! <laughs> no, <laughs> not even close. <laughs> so I have no clue across the board. I wish them luck. Apparently, he's a not Bane Bane character because he has a luchador mask and is very buff. Mm. Okay, because you know Spider Man's the real Batman in the MC or the Marvel universe. Man, what is Sony doing? <laughs> Why can't Sony just like take like a million bucks for each character, give it to Marvel, and just not touch those characters anymore? Let them do whatever the hell they want. Like, just be like, here you go, Foggy. Here you go. Here's everything. Just give us whatever percentage you think is fair, and yep. we will do nothing. <laughs> nothing. And we'll just make a ton of money off your back. But no, yeah. we're gonna go make fucking Morbius and make a pile of shit. Um, okay. Still mad Doctor, spend money on that money. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> Doctor Strange trailer, Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness trailer. I haven't watched this because I had a lot of people text me today and tell me there's spoilers. Uh, I'm gonna let you be the judge and spoil what you feel like isn't too spoilery. But I, I was, so I'll say this about the first trailer. I wasn't even happy that they, I was happy, but not also kind of upset that they spoiled Patrick Stewart returning. So I don't know. I don't know. It's considered spoil spoilers anymore. Um, mm -hmm. cause uh, these things aren't really spoilers to me. Okay. Um, but if you really don't want to hear these, I guess skip like two minutes. Um, first of all, what if is like necessary watching? I do know that. Yeah. I'll say that right off the bat. Um, we get a glimpse of Captain Carter in this. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we get hints at the Illuminati in this. I have a feeling that the... Did you finish What If? Oh, yeah. So I get the feeling that that Avengers team they assembled at the end, whatever they called themselves, um, is a part of this movie. Um, and then the big... The one I wish they didn't put in the trailer, but I'm going to talk about it because I'm excited about it, was somebody rolls up alongside the camera and you see this like smooth yellow edge that looks a lot like the wheelchair of Professor X from X-Men, the animated series. Mm. Okay. So that might be a part of That just gave me multiverse. chills because, man... Like, I I knew it was Professor X, but now that it's X Men ninety two Professor X, so like this has nothing to do with the Fox Professor X. Makes it better, wow. right? That's fucking bold. Yeah, I got little tinglys going on in my hair follicles right now. Other than yeah. that, it's a lot of the stuff we already saw. They're in the multiverse. Wanda. This this one centered more around Wanda, mm -hmm. so it, it basically. I felt like this trailer did two things. It told everybody, watch WandaVision, which you should do anyways because it's amazing, yeah. and watch What If because it's essential. And those are kind of the lead-ins, the direct lead-ins, at least, to this uh, movie. Mm -hmm. I'm super yeah. excited for it. Dude, if it's the, if it's 92 X-Men Professor X, I'm going to freak. You'll cry. You're not going to freak. You'll just weep tears of joy. I probably will. Yeah, because the only I know thing I will. cry at is comic book movies. Yeah, I know, and me too. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, no crying, no crying on podcasts. So we're gonna uh, jump to this interview with Rachel Pollock, and we'll see everybody on the other side. 
And we're back. Okay. Um, usually this is the point where we tell you to check out uh, Rachel's latest book, but um, you can check out the stuff she's written. Uh, I do recommend the New Gods run that she co-wrote with uh, our good buddy, my good buddy, Tom Pyre, Tom Pear, uh, whichever you prefer. And uh, obviously her Doom Patrol run that includes Codpiece. Yeah. Read that it's also, shit. if you uh, like the books without the little pictures in it, she's a very accomplished mm. novelist as well. Oh, so. yeah. Very accomplished. She's got a lot of books out. She's won uh, several Eisners. So, yeah. Check it out. Uh, comic book news. We got a little bit here. Sad, very sad news coming up. But uh, Frank Miller and Dan Didio are teaming up for a new publishing line called Frank Miller Presents. The new publisher will feature new creator on comics, but start with continuations of Sid Sinny and Ronin. So this this is Frank Miller going to every publisher and being like, listen, guys, I got more for Sin City. And they're like, Frank, stop. Just we don't want any more Sin City. Like you you finished Sin City's done. Like you you did the whole Dame to Kill for it. We we're done. But he's like, no, I'm gonna fine i'll publish it myself and that's what's happening uh i'm not excited for these i'm gonna read the fuck out of these <laughs> okay so we have two opposite opinions here um, um i'm not super excited for them honestly uh but ronin's one of those books that i just adore i wonder how he's going to do more of it because it kind of has a very finalized ending doesn't he die at the end i believe so it's been a minute since i read it uh, yeah. front to back um, but Sin City, I can see how you can do more. I just don't know why you'd want to. Um, yeah. But if this is what gets people in the door for another creator-owned publishing line, fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially if apparently the mission is to have like books that appeal to Frank Miller's sense of storytelling, which if that's mm. true and that works okay. out, I'm in because I'm obviously a, a mark for Frank Miller stuff, especially his earlier stuff. Um, I mean, most of his work has been so influential in everything that I read that I'm always going to apologize for Frank Miller. <laughs> um, I thought it was funny that right as his uh, NDA ends, that Dan Didio announces this and he's now a part of this. Yeah. Um, anyone doesn't know he hasn't been able to talk about anything for like two years mm -hmm. uh, because of his ties to DC. So I'm interested. I, I I think the most interesting part of this is I want to hear Didio go off about what happened behind the scenes of DC, and I feel like we're yeah. gonna get that now. Yeah, I wish we could talk to him about it. That'd be sick. But yeah, come here, Dan. Come talk yeah, shit about DC well, with me. I'll chat with you, Dan. <laughs> uh, okay, sad news. Very sad news. Uh, comic book legend and just an overall good dude. I mean, I think almost every almost every con I went to, I would see Neil Adams there doing art and chatting with people. He sadly passed away this week, age 80. Uh, so influential. I mean, he's such a long list of uh comics that he's done i mean he's known for his batman art um he really he really took batman and just and just brought it to another level with his art i mean it's so influential you talk about frank miller uh this guy i think is just as influential for artists uh for sure um without a doubt so yeah i mean it's it's uh it's you could almost every Every story, every run at DC, you could pick out some Neil Adams uh, art or at least influence from it. So very sad stuff. I didn't even know he uh, was sick. I don't know how, how it happened or what, but it's still really sad. I mean, he's, yeah. But uh, it's still good that, I mean, we have all his art to, you know, for him to live through eternally. So that's that's always good. Yeah, I think Neil's, even though he's not my cup of tea per se, mm -hmm. He's one of the most influential creators of 
the modern comics era. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know like we always talk about Miller and the, the dark Knight book, mm-hmm. which to me is like a huge book, but that kind of, that influenced the, the nineties into now, but right. you wouldn't have gotten there without Neil. And, um, yeah, it's tough to even talk about one thing with Neil, because then you talk about his, uh, his green arrow, green lantern run. Mm-hmm. Um, you talk about all the stuff he did at Marvel. It just, everything he touched was gold. Um, mm-hmm. but minus the recent stuff, but, um, <laughs> I'll say I got a chance to meet Neil years ago. I got a signed copy of the the aforementioned uh, Green Arrow, Green Lantern book from him. And he was super nice. He was super busy. He had a huge booth. But he took the time to say hey to everybody and shake hands. Um, and I think what's biggest with him was how he went out of his way to stand up for creators back when it wasn't cool to stand up for creators. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. there wasn't a Twitter back then to like cheer him on. He was just a guy doing what he felt was the right thing. And uh, I think that at the end of the day should and will be his legacy um, mm-hmm. moving forward. Something to be said too about how influential influential he was and how he was almost one of those guys to like not be put in a position like Jim Lee or anyone or like, you know, the McFarlands are like being some type of like higher up editorial position or like, you know, it, it's almost kind of strange of how like, you know, he's always sticking up for people, but also he never made it to that like corporate up that corporate ladder. And I'm sure there's some, there's I some, think that's why he didn't make it yeah. up that corporate ladder. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and he was always, easily, yeah, there was always the joke later on because even people I knew who were like huge Neil Adams fans, Mm-hmm. Um, would admit that some of the stuff he did like during New 52 remember how he always had that book that like wasn't continuity but it right. was like Batman and Ra's al Ghul again yeah. and uh, even his fans were kind of like eh. um, and I don't mean to shit out him I just we always had the joke that that was DC being like let's just give Neil a bunch of money to shut the hell up <laughs> he was that guy who would yeah. always be like on top of them about the stuff right so. right right yeah, so I mean, good on him for always fighting for what he believed in, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's you can always tell what era his art came from. I mean, it's it, like you said, it moved it from the seventies, eighties to the nineties, and um, more more modern, I would say. Yeah, and but, his uh, design on Batman is still like one of my favorites. That blue with the yeah, blue and gray blue, with the yellow symbol is yellow. just fantastic. Yeah. yeah, it pops. Um, okay, let's talk about what we read this week, Chris. Uh, the most important book you'll read this year. I read Godzilla Power Rangers issue two by Colin Bunn and William II on art. Are you reading this? So I'm still in the middle of this whole th- uh, problem with my credit or my debit card. Oh, so that's right, that's right. I'm going to be light again this week on what I read. Okay, no problems. This, yes. uh, so Godzilla and the Megazord are fighting because the Power Rangers have ended up on this other universe and they both like one punch each other and kill each other. But before that, there's this back, big epic battle where the Power Rangers and the Megazord say, we need a sword. So they summon their giant sword and they like stab Godzilla through the chest with it and like they get blasted by the radiation. And so they both like fall back. And, like, Godzilla goes down to the ocean. And as they're down, uh, it's not Monarch, but it's these other people that, like, the the people that have teamed up with Rita um, that want to kill Godzilla start blasting everyone with their UFOs while they're, like, down for the count to, like, finish them off. And that's when the Power Rangers realize, shit, man, we shouldn't have fought Godzilla because there's this other power here trying to, like, screw people over. So they, like, hijack one of the UFOs. Um and get on there because they've actually Reed has captured the, the green ranger. Um, but they go to the spaceship to save him, And then that, that group of people releases gig on the other Kaiju villain. So I think this book, we're going to see more and more villains. And I know Colin Bunn specifically talks about ones that he's liked in the past. So gig on is probably one of them. Uh, so they have to fight gig on, but then Rita summons a couple of her, uh, putty monsters and they're, they're famous ones from the, uh, 
like popular ones from Power Rangers, and I can't remember what they are, but she summons them like beside the Godzilla creature, the Gigan. So it's like them two together, and they have to like fight it again with the Megazord. It was pretty dope. Uh, yeah, Colin's Colin's just having a lot of fun with this book, man. It's so cool. That book sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's so, it's so awesome. Yeah, just like just the spectacle of it is fucking great. And I even I was talking to someone at work about it who's not into comics, and we were talking about Godzilla movies and Power Rangers, and I was like, dude, there's a comic book out right now where the the Dragon Zord fights Godzilla, and they're like, that sounds so fucking cool. And I was like, yeah, it is. So go read it. Um, Dark Knights of Steel issue six, Tom Taylor and Putri on the art. Have you read this? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, I won't spoil it too much for you here. I mean, Constantine, they focus on him a little bit. They talk about the whole Tim Drake thing working for, uh, the, um, I want to say the, there's the L's and then there's, I don't know who the hell they call the, like the, uh, lightning people. Um, but anyway, oh, the storms. So Diana says that her mom will side with the storms over the elves because they've always had a pack, even though Diana loves uh, Kara. Um, there, but there's a there's a plan from the elves side, uh, like the the super uh, Superman side, to kill Queen Hippolyta uh, so that Diana will be the new queen. She can get them to side with each other. Um, Constantine summons Entrigan, <laughs> who, uh, pretty cool because Entrigan is Ra's Ghul because he wants to bring back, um, the Storm King, but he says, no, he's pretty much dead. I can probably bring back the Prince though. Um, but he says, I will trade you for the Titans. I know they're hidden somewhere. So the Teen Titans are a group and they're being hidden somewhere as these like special children with powers, which is pretty fucking cool. Uh, Cal tries to stop the Amazons and it's weird because like him and Kara truly believe they have not done anything wrong because, you know, he's killed Batman and Kara's killed uh, the storm fleet. And mm -hmm. it's almost like they're being possessed because they really don't think they've done anything wrong. Um, but so he goes to meet them and Hippolyta just stabs him in the chest with a sword <laughs> And they, like, chain him up and capture him, which is pretty awesome. You don't expect Superman to get, like, subdued like that. But it's all magic, right? Magical weapons. So, um, he's captured, and that's where he meets Lois Lane, who's part of the Amazons, which is pretty cool. And then the Amazons are heading to fight the elves. So, fucking great issue. Who magically would have something to benefit from all them fighting? Because your possession thing sits with me now. I'm like, I wonder if somebody's well, possessed them and it's going to be like... About, the... We talked about the green man in the first issues, right? And he kind of disappeared, right? Did he disappear? Or did they kill... I can't remember what happened to him. Oh, no, yeah, because they introduced someone like issue four and then we haven't seen him yeah. since. So, so maybe, he, maybe someone just yeah. wants to sow chaos, yeah. Yeah, and that would be the Joker, right? Yeah. Because my thought was somebody yeah. coming in and being like, I'm going to start this little war and then I'm going to come in. I'm going to take over. Right. Like the, and, um, like Dinklage there. Yeah. <laughs> not, he didn't really do that. I mean, it, but could the, be, it could be like Merlin or something. Cause I mean, we are in the, 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 you know, the middle ages and Merlin is a character from DC, especially pretty popular with the justice league dark right now. So it could be something like that. So is like Lancelot a thing in DC? I don't. I'm not sure. I mean, they they talked about Knights of the Round Table and the Justice League Dark and stuff like that. So I think all those stories are kind of like up for grabs, pretty much. Hmm. Yeah, kinda that's like, intriguing. Oh, I can't wait to read. I love the series. I just yeah, I'm getting it digitally. Really, so, really, yep, it's a really good issue. Um. Rogues 2 was really good. They basically make it to, you get to see Gorilla, you know, the, the whole story behind the Rogues was uh, they want to rob Gorilla Island. Uh, and they make it there. And we find out some stuff about it. So, um, and we get to see Gorilla Grodd. It's like the Gorilla Island is more like Wall Street than anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is pretty funny to see. So, um, it was a great issue. I'm loving that book. Gorilla Grodd, Rogue. like all old and have Trump hair now. 
No, he's got like a business <laughs> suit on though, and he's like sitting around this business meeting, and like they're expect they're like, "Where do you think the money is?" And there's like this giant bank <laughs> that looks like something out of like Washington D.C. And he's like, "I think that's where all the money is." Um, if I ever Rogue find Sun? who took my card online, I'm gonna fucking punch him because this is yeah. a great week of comics, and I miss so yeah. many. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good week. <laughs> Rogue Sun three, I will say, I'll start a trail off of this book. This book really got me back into the story. It kind of develops the whole universe of Rogue Sun and people that were like that used to support him before he gave up the mantle. So it was a great issue. We meet some new characters, and we find out who really killed the father. Um, and it's someone within the family. So pretty great issue. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, this is the ju- death of the Justice League this week, folks. Um, and that's pretty much it. They die. No, um, this is a. Uh, it kind of. It, it pretty much picks up right after Justice League Incarnate. Uh, so if you're reading that, you're enjoying that. You'll like this issue. They um, they show up to meet. Uh, oh man, I can never remember the hell his. So, uh, he, I can't remember this guy's name. The the bad guy from Justice League Incarnate. Oh, Pariah. So Pariah shows up and he has a whole dark army that has like, you know, a bunch of iconic villains in like dark form. So the Justice League's fighting them. And then Pariah, like they start defeating the the whole dark army he has. And Pariah is finally like, oh, well, I'm just strong enough to kill you. So he like vaporizes all of the Justice League. And the only person to that's uh, survived, well, not all the Justice League. So like, the uh the flash and superboy and some of the like some of the people like detective chimp firestorm are at are at the um hall of justice and black adam gets transported back and he says the justice league are dead and then it says continued in dark crisis number one so like uh superman wonder woman uh batman are gone green lantern john stewart aquaman yep it sounds like uh, uh, the single player mode in Super Smash Brothers. All the dark yeah. versions come. Yeah, pretty much. That's what it is. <laughs> uh, Beneath us. This was a Kickstarter from uh, Afterlight Comics. This, these are the people that did Moth Hill. They're a horror imprint, or not an imprint, just a horror publisher. Basically, really good story. The art is kind of creepy. It follows a town that gets hit by a tsunami, but something supernatural is happening there. Uh, with these weird monsters that are, like, killing people. This group of people that are uh, prison inmates go as, like, a, um, like, therapy to go help these people that have been, like, their their town has been, like, destroyed, and some weird shit starts happening, and that's kind of where it leaves off. It was a great first issue. And then Saga. Um, All you really need to know, I forget what issue number this is, 58. Uh, You see some penis in this issue. I know everybody cares. Um, some luscious penis. Yeah. Did you read this? I did. Okay. Uh, so what's what's the big takeaway? I mean, the the robot kingdom, or I guess it's not the robot kingdom. I don't know. One of the um, one of the mercenaries gets told I think it's that landfall. Landfall. Okay. It's the wherever the wing people come from. They're trying to okay. find um the the half the, the little girl the main character of the story yeah they want to kill her so then they highlight all the main all the the b level characters from the past and they want to kill them off yeah the mom sells drugs the little girl plays guitar and their the uncle character's past is coming back to haunt them yep um and then yeah they show everybody that they've met in this like collage at the end and mm-hmm. if they kill goose a riot. Gus. They killed Gus. Gus. I'm out. Gus. Yeah, a riot. I'm out. I'm done. Yeah. Uh, and I, man? That was kind of like, that was, that was kind of just a lame literary device to me to be like, okay, we just took this huge break where you kill the main character, right? And you confirm that he's dead, whatever. Uh, Cause we talk about it almost every issue. And then you're like, okay, now we got you to this point of the story. We're going to tell more story. And then the story ends up being we're going to kill all those other characters that you loved <laughs> from the past. And it's like, come on, guys. Like, there's got to be more going on. Uh, yeah, like, Gus better be able to defend himself and kill them. Uh, yeah, they better just leave Gus alone. There's got to be more, like, 
there's got to be something with the the government because obviously the governments are getting involved now once again. Yeah, right. Um, I actually thought all in all this is one of the better issues since they returned. Yeah, I think so. Because mm-hmm. it really just like- it just moved the story. It didn't worry mm-hmm. about the bullshit. It didn't worry about right. like putting in some one liner that I didn't care about. Just move the story along, and it got some plot points that I'm intrigued in moving forward. I especially the uncle. Not, I'm still not. Con- yeah, I like the uncle. I'm still not convinced Marco's dead because of magic. So even though they said, "Oh, molecular level, we tested the skull, and it's his," blah blah blah. Still not convinced. Uh, because they wouldn't keep going back to it so often. You know what I mean? Like, you yeah, see I can the see skull. It. We we keep hearing about the skull. Everybody's confirmed. Like there, there has to be a one up that they have, like a you know a, a secret weapon here that they're not talking about. Um, yeah, yeah, and the little girl even says, um, "There's been many people that take his place throughout my yeah. life. Some good, some not so good." Yeah, and that kind of foreshadowed to me that like something else is going. Like obviously, we're gonna get more male characters coming through, father figures coming through for her, right? Right. Um, but yeah, that was an okay issue. Mm-hmm. Just don't kill Gus. Yep. Yeah, don't kill Gus. Um, that's all I had this week for now. Some stuff I still got to read. Oh, and I read Odin's Eye number one because uh, I do have that really great art is fantastic. Really heavy lore about Odin and all the um, the Norse gods. It's, it was pretty awesome and super metal. So check it out if you can find it. Got Batman Beyond the White Knight number two. Oh, um, yep. this issue basically centers around Bruce and him like meeting up with the Joker, and we find out that the Joker actually during his fight with Azrael planted a chip in Bruce's brain oh. so that he can project himself through Bruce's eyes. You know, some real comic book science shit going on. Yeah, this yeah, heavy heavy <laughs> comic. <sorry. laughs> But it creates this like inner monologue for Bruce where he's talking with Joker and nobody else can see him. Oh. And then we get kind of a, we get Dick hunting him down and finally finding him and them having their kind of father son anger moment where Dick feels like he's doing the right thing and that Bruce was always wrong and Bruce feels the other way around and blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. Um, we also get the conflict between uh, Dick and Babs. Uh, because Barbara Gordon, um, because Barbara went with the the police and Dick went with the GTO and that kind of got in the way of their relationship growing up. Um, but the big reveal here is at the end, uh, Bruce gets to one of his little mini bat caves because, of course, he has so many. Of course. And we find out that where he was hiding his last, like, ditch effort in case something happened was underneath Harley's uh, house and we it's revealed that he's got a suit under there so he's going to get in the suit again and be Batman again mm-hmm. and then we also get the the shocking reveal at the end that uh, Bruce is married to Harley which I get the feeling is just like at one of those things where he did it just to, like protect her and give her all these things so she could take care right. of her kids yeah yeah I agree Thor number 24, a.k.a. 750. Uh, <laughs> this was just a... It's the funeral of Odin. So in the last issue, Odin died. And we get the funeral with all the different Asgardians. And then throughout the issue, different creators from Thor past come in and tell like little mini stories. So Thor opens up the, the Book of the Gods that only the, the king of Asgard can read. And his decision is to read it to everybody. Um, A few passages about Odin. And then we get like Walt Simonson does a story in here. Jason Aaron does a story. Al Ewing does a story. Um, All fun and really good. But the main story with Donnie and Nick was that intro. And then the ending where we find out that Thor isn't exactly dead per se. That when... You remember in the last issue of Hulk when you saw the messed up hammer? Mm -hmm. So when Thor destroyed the hammer at the same time Odin had died, when he recreated the hammer, he trapped Odin's soul inside the hammer. Mm. 
So now it's Odin inside the hammer. Okay. And Thor's telling him that he needs, you know, he needs to leave. He needs to go, go to um, Valhalla and be free and all that stuff. And that's when Thor reveals to him that there's nothing in Valhalla anymore. It's just the door was destroyed. It's an empty land with nobody there. Mm. So that kind of leads into whatever Donnie's doing next for that. So I'm cool. excited for that. Awesome. And then my last issue, <laughs> trigger warning everybody, it's going to be a little political. Biden's Titans versus Q. Wow. Wow. So in this issue, um, Biden's Titans, uh, Biden's dog Major dies, and he finds out that Q is the one responsible for it. So he goes to his best buddy, Bernie Sanders, who <laughs> is connected to the multiverse. Oh, wow. So Bernie connects to the multiverse to reveal to him that if he goes down to Texas, that he will it'll be revealed that JFK is going to be back alive and Q is going to appear there. When they go down there, they run into the great Joe Rogan and they have mm-hmm. a little back and forth. And that's when uh, Pete Buttigieg, dressed up as a cowboy, reveals <laughs> that a portal has opened and a <laughs> JFK from another dimension comes through and reveals himself to be Q. And then he reveals that he's not the only Q, that there's Qs everywhere. And then a giant Godzilla Q comes through and Biden grows using his erection powers. Oh my god. And fights the Godzilla. After he kills the Godzilla and the rest of the team shows up, it is revealed through the Star Trek character Q. <laughs> okay. That Q was not responsible for Major's death. That who is really responsible is Dracula. Wow. So in the next issue, Biden's Titans will fight Dracula. What the hell is going on? I fucking love this series. Oh my god, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's insane, dude. Who thinks of this shit? I highly wow. recommend anybody. So every issue is a number one. And okay. that started because the, the series started as Trump's Titans. And every issue is a number one because number ones are the best. Right. So proclaims Trump. <laughs> Awesome. Except for the one issue where there's number two, and it's the Donald who laughs, number two. Oh, my God. Amazing. Keen Spot knows what's up. Awesome. All right, Mike. <laughs> That's amazing. That's all I had this week. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? You can find me at Fortress Ricker on Twitter. Where can they find you and or the show? You can find me at Fortress Chris on Twitter. You can find the show at Fortress Comics on Twitter. Also, FortressComicNews.com. Remember, everybody, give us a five-star review on the podcatcher. Like, subscribe, share, comment down below on the YouTube. And if you want to go the extra mile, Patreon.com slash Fortress Comics. Thank you all so much for watching and listening this week. We'll see you all here next week. 